Welcome to the Timmins Public Library Virtual Historic Cemetery Walk for the Tisdale Cemetery. This presentation was prepared and pre presented by Karina Douglas Takiasu, reference librarian at the Timmins Public Library. The original presentation was done live on Tuesday, September 14, 2021. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. I would like to begin by acknowledging that Timmins is on Treaty 9 territory, which is the traditional land of the Metogamy First Nation. The land on which we gather has been home to many Ojibwe, Chippewa, Meshkegawak Cree, Algonquin, and Metis peoples. In the last two cemetery presentations, I opened with some quotes either from literary works or from the local newspaper articles. Today's quotation comes from a fantasy novel by the late Terry Pratchett, and you have probably heard it expressed in similar adages. Do you know, not know that a man is not dead while his name is still spoken? This comes from Going Postal, which is novel 33 in the Discworld series. As you will soon see, there were many individuals laid to rest here and whose names live on in other printed testimonies, but where their bodies were placed have not been recorded beyond Tisdale Township Cemetery. While working on the previous two cemetery presentations, I learned that the Tisdale Cemetery was the last of the three main cemeteries established in Timmins, and for a period of nearly five years between 1915 and 1920, it was the closest mixed denomination cemetery that could be accessed from Mountjoy Township, the town of Timmins, and Schumacher. A request was made to Father Charles Terrio in 1919 for some land adjacent to his Roman Catholic Cemetery on Pine Street South to have a Protestant cemetery, and in 1920, the first official Protestant burials took place in town. With the 1915-1920 time frame in mind, it would stand to reason that many of the graves from those early years would have included the 1918 influenza pandemic, which showed to be true, but you will see that there's not many marked graves and headstones from that era. For those of you who have taken part or viewed in the other cemetery presentations, you have probably noticed the absence of many significant names associated with the Timmins and Porcupine Camp. In this photograph alone, there are four individuals represented. No Anthony Timmins in the colorful lights projected on the McIntyre head frame from number 11 shaft of the McIntyre mine, which is named after Sandy McIntyre and run for many years by John Paris, J.P. Bickle. The statue in the foreground, of course, is Frederick W. Schumacher, for whom the town of Schumacher in Tisdale Township is named. Although these men left their mark on the landscape of Timmins, they are buried in cemeteries in large cities far away from the community. Noah Timmins is buried at the Cimetière Notre Dame de Neige in Montreal. Sandy McIntyre, born Alexander Oliphant, is buried in the Prospect Cemetery in Toronto. J.P. Bickell is buried in Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Toronto, and Frederick W. Schumacher is buried at the Greenlawn Cemetery in Greenford, Ohio. On a side note, according to the book Places in Ontario, the, name, the area that became Tisdale Township was named in 1903 after David Tisdale, who was a member of Parliament for Norfolk South, a riding near the north shore of Lake Erie, which was abolished and redistributed that same year. Finding a nodal name in Tisdale that would be recognized to a broad audience outside the community was a challenge with both time limits and the availability of research materials at hand, but there was one name that stood out from recent memory. Father Leslie John Costello, former Toronto Maple Leafs championship player and founding member of the Flying Fathers charity hockey team of priests, was born in South Porcupine in 1928, and he was laid to rest in the cemetery after his death in 2002. Even for those who don't follow sports, his name and the Flying Fathers are in the community lore. While researching the bookends of Father Costello's life, I discovered that there was much left in the unwritten words between a few lines of text. Likewise, in telling a story of the past through the graves of the Timsdale Cemetery, the words not recorded and the scraps of searchable text brought to life in the experience of those who worked, lived, and died in the first decade following the Porcupine Gold Rush. This virtual walk by no means covers an in-depth look at the Tisdale Cemetery, but I hope to provide an interesting look into the past. I used several cross-reference materials, including Ancestry Library Edition, findagrave.com, the Porcupine Advance, which is available online, uh, the Daily Press, which is a microfilm here in the Timmins Public Library, the Ontario Vital Statistics Index is on microfilm, uh, the Deaf um, MS Real Series 937.
As a recap of the previous two presentations, the first burial in the porcupine camp took place in 1910. At that time, a young French-Canadian resident with the surname Minal died. He was buried at a small point of land that stuck out on the southeastern shore of Porcupine Lake. This site was known as Edwards Point. On July 11, 1911, a massive forest fire, which became known as the Porcupine Fire, tore through South Porcupine and left a known 71 people dead in its wake. Many bodies were buried where they were found, and a few were shipped home. 22 were buried at Edwards Point, which was then renamed Dead Men's Point. Over the course of 1911 and into the spring of 1912, other people who died in the camp were buried just a few feet west of Dead Man's Point. This was known as the Government Cemetery and later simply the Whitney Cemetery, which continues to operate to this day under the city of Timmins after the townships were amalgamated in 1973. And the pictures that you are seeing here come, um, were taken in the summer of 2021. And they show the memorial to the porcupine fire, which had been gifted from the Toronto Chamber of Commerce in 1912. The Weiss family grave, the only actual grave that still stands to this day from the 1911 fire. The Dead Man's uh, Point site, the Whitney Cemetery facing east, and the lower western corner of Whitney, which you can see, or the Whitney Cemetery, which goes towards Porcupine Lake. The Timmins Memorial Cemetery. In October of 1911, a young priest from Quebec who had gone to the, dia gone to the diocese of Haleberry was posted to the Porcupine Camp. Father Charles Eugene Terrio established St. Anthony's Church in what would become the town of Timmins. He was an also a good friend of Noah Anthony Timmins. Originally, he had a cemetery on the church grounds on Fifth Avenue in Timmins. Soon more land was needed, which Father Terrio purchased from Jack Dalton, one of his parishioners. This established the Roman Catholic Cemetery on Pine Street South. In 1919, a request was made to Father Terriel to sell some of that land to establish a Protestant cemetery in Timmins since the nearest site was the Tisdale Cemetery, a good four miles or 6.3 kilometers east of the town. The land that was purchased was the, and the first Protestant burials took place in June of 1920. Today, the Timmins Memorial Cemetery is a mixed denomination cemetery managed under the city of Timmins. And in this picture, we'll see from uh, clockwise from top left, a crucifix on the hill that overlooks the children's section of the cemetery, and they, um, as well as the historic Catholic section in the distance in the original um, St. Anthony's uh, Cemetery. There is a mass grave and monument of eight Finnish and one Galician Meyer that, are, that were killed in the 1928 Hollinger Fire, which is in the historic Protestant section of the cemetery. In the more contemporary sections, there is a Chinese community section that was established mid-century and dedicated in uh, 1980, and it can be found in the um, Protestant section of the cemetery. And there are also the graves of Bill and Maggie Buffalo Leclerc, uh, known as the mother of Cam Scotia, previously dubbed Princess Maggie. And you'll notice that uh, William Leclerc, her husband, has a cemetery or has a headstone that is much older than. Um, Maggie Buffalo Leclerc, and that is because her cemetery or her headstone was only dedicated in 2017. She did not have a headstone prior to that, despite being an honorary lifetime member of the Chamber of Commerce and such a well known figure in the community of Timmins, and she passed away in 1965. Their headstones are found in the Protestant section of the Timmins Memorial Cemetery. Across the street to the east of the Timmins Memorial Cemetery, next to a mobile home park, there is another small cemetery that does not yet appear on the official city of Timmins Cemetery maps. That small cemetery belonged to St. Mary's Romanian Orthodox Church, which is located at 8th Avenue and Maple Street North. There are approximately 35 graves or sites in the cemetery, which is now full. The earliest date of death appears to be 1942. St. Mary's Romanian Orthodox Cemetery was put in the care of the city of Timmins a few years ago. However, the priests had passed away before any of the records were brought over to the city and are still likely in possession of the church. In the summertime, the fence does remain open and people can access the cemetery to visit. The Tisdale Cemetery is located approximately halfway between Timmins and South Porcupine on the north side of Highway 101 East, just past the bottom of Rhea Hill, if you are coming from the east. 
the most distinct characteristic of the cemetery that you can easily tell the, is that you can easily tell the historic up to around the mid 1950s area from that of the contemporary area. The cemetery developed from the east, and the majority of the graves also faced east. Most of the headstones are upright, whereas those in the newer sections of the cemetery lay flat, and many are oriented in different directions. There are also cremation burial sites and a columbaria for ashes. Most graves in the contemporary section of the cemetery have been decorated with planters or solar-powered lighting, as seen in the second nighttime photograph in this slide. In the time since these two pictures with the aurora borealis were taken in 2015, extremely bright LED streetlights have been installed along the highway corridor between Timmins and South Porcupine. It'd be unlikely to have a similar night scene like the one that was photographed on an unseasonably warm night back in November of 2015. By June of 1915, there were two main cemeteries in the Porcupine Camp. The Whitney Township Cemetery in the south shore of Porcupine Lake beside Dead Man's Point, and the Timmins Roman Catholic Cemetery on Pine Street south in Timmins. However, if somebody died in Timmins that was not Roman Catholic, burial would have to take place at the Whitney Cemetery, which was accessible by rail, but a good 8 miles or nearly 13 kilometers away from Timmins. It is not known if there were any church site burials at the Protestant churches at the time. In July of 1915, undertakers Mr. Barton and J.T. Easton proposed to the council that an area of government land in Schumacher, formerly used as a prison camp, be made into a cemetery. Two weeks later, the Porcupine Advance noted that the first burials took place on the site and during the previous day on July 22, 1915. And just to recap, here is a map of the Porcupine Camp as it would have appeared in 1911. To help orientate yourself, this is a close-up view. This map comes from the Ontario Department of Mines report from 1911. The town of Timmins had not been, yet been established, but the Roman Catholic Cemetery can be placed reference Miller Lake, which is now Hollinger Park. The Whitney Cemetery to the east is relatively easy to locate with the profile of Porcupine Lake. The area of the Tisdale Cemetery is a little harder to pinpoint as the Timiskaming and Northern Ontario Railway Line only goes as far as the Dome Extension property at the time. From a September 1915 article regarding a liquor license application, it was estimated that the population of Porcupine Camp was between 5,000 and 5,500. Using Google Maps, this is the Porcupine Camp area as it would appear today. This is a contemporary view of Timmins, Schumacher, South Porcupine. And you can see that with the end of rail service in 1990, the tracks were removed shortly after. It's a bit difficult to line up all the cemetery sites, but you can still appreciate how they're spaced out. And on the contemporary um, maps, of course, using satellite and um, aerial photography, you can actually see the cemetery sites there. Additionally, there are no issues of the Porcupine Advance from 1913, 1914, and up to June of 1915. The volume and num number and issue count between December 20 of 1912 and June 4 of 1915 are in sequence, as though the two missing two and a half years never happened. Checking through the Vital Statistics Index from 1913, there is a verified death for Sidney William E. Smith, who died at the Dome Mine town site in November 2nd of 1913. And this is an infant's headstone that you can see with Sidney E.W. Smith um, who, date on there. And it's almost two years before the cemetery was established formerly. Sidney E.W. Smith would have been born in late February or March of 1912, uh, yet there is no vital statistics entry for his birth. No birth or baptismal records have been found through ancestry. And without the Porcupine Advance, um, which would not print until March 28th of 1912, there's an, and no issues in between, we're not sure there is no recording of his birth or death date. Having looked through the Vital Statistics Index, there are four possibilities for this grave site. Sydney was buried prior to the cemetery's official designation. He was buried elsewhere, exhumed and transferred to Tisdale at a later point. He was not laid to rest until 1915 or later, or that he was never actually buried here and the headstone is symbolic in his memory.
Through the articles in the Porcupine Advance published between October 16th and December 25th, 1918, there were approximately 41 deaths from influenza in Schumacher and South Porcupine. However, not all the burials did take place at the Tisdale Cemetery. Using death records through ancestry with the Tim and Schumacher Whitney listed under the Timiskaming District, approximately 27 records noted South Porcupine or Tisdale Township as the place of burial. From those 27 records, however, there are only six that could be found in a contemporary index in the city of Timmins, and their respective headstones can be found today. The question remains is what happened to the other 21 possible graves? And the headstones are largely grouped together in the historic section of the Tisdale Cemetery. Six headstones of adults that died, Giuseppe Grazion, age 23, George E. Keller, age 33, Jakob Lampy, age 33, William H. Humphrey, age 35, James Addison, Adamson, age 36, and Blanche Harriet Foster. And all these uh, individuals are basically between the ages of 25 and 35 approximately. A partial explanation for the unaccounted graves was found in an article from the Porcupine Events published on June 29, 1933. In a regular column titled The Canadian Legion in Porcupine, subtitled Our Glorious Dead, Great War Veteran and President of the Royal Canadian Legion Branch 88, Austin Neem, noted that there had never been a registry established for the Tim Tisdale Cemetery. Many veterans' graves could not be located at the time, nor could many other graves that did not have a headstone. This was now 18 years and possibly hundreds of burials after the cemetery was established. There were also changes made to the layout of the cemetery over the years, which means many more graves may have been lost to time and memory. And this is a photograph of Austin Neem from the June 24, 1948 issue of the Porcupine Advance. Mr. Neem died a little more than a year later on November 9, 1949, but he is buried at the Victoria Lawn Cemetery in St. Catharines, Ontario. Influenza and the Porcupine Advance In view of the threatened infection in the district recently, and in view of the fact that the town guards against many forms of infection by the use of chlorine in water, Councillor D. Mackey of Tisdale was forwarded this week with the suggestion that the town of Timmins and the township of Tisdale for their mutual protection make for provision for chlorinating of all wells used in the town and the township. The quoted text is from an article in the Porcupine Advance from October 2nd, 1918. It provides some sense of where the town of Timmins was and the township of Tisdale in terms of the implanting influenza pandemic that would said it, see its first death just 11 days later. Although its contemporary name was the Spanish flu, researchers now know that it was a type of avian flu that originated in the United States. The threatened infection of district recently also refers to the diphtheria outbreak in the Manita area in the town in late September. Diphtheria is a serious bacteria-based respiratory tract illness in which a bacteria creates toxins that can lead to death in patients, of which there were several during this outbreak. Chlorination of municipal water sources was first tried in Maidenhead in England in 1897 after an outbreak of typhoid. By 1911, many cities in the United States and Canada were chlorinating their water supplies. It would appear that Councillor Maxey's recommendation was followed, as there were references as early as April 1919 to implement a mechanical process of replacing the manual mixing pro method of chlorinating the water. Some headlines from October 2, 1918, regarding the diphtheria outbreak. Although influenza was quite rampant in Ontario, the Porcupine Camp did not see any cases officially until mid-October of 1918. In late September in the Manita area, there was an outbreak of diphtheria. On September 24th, Mrs. Simeon Roberts died, but her 12-year-old daughter recovered. Mrs. Roberts was buried in South Porcupine at midnight on September 25th. As a precautionary measure, several meetings and other functions were shut down by early October. Manita Public School was closed and fumigated. The Porcupine Advance also reports of Council Mackey's chlorination proposal. Mayor McLaughlin promises to bring the proposal to the attention of the Board of Health. October 9, 1918, influenza spreading. On October 9, the Porcupine Advance reported that there were no cases of diphtheria in the past week. 
Influenza is reported to be spreading rapidly through Ontario, and the province's public health authorities fear that one half of the population would be affected by the epidemic. The strain of influenza was reported to be far more severe than common influenza, and people with symptoms were advised to seek and to heed to medical attention right away. Despite this, the Provincial Board of Health advised against closing schools, theatres, etc. to stop the, thread, the spread, but it would not interfere where local boards of health enacted such measures. The province advised against anything that would unnecessarily dislocate business. It was noted an epidemic of illness in Haraleberry several months earlier was now thought to have been influenza. Regional Police Magistrate Atkinson and Inspector Blackwell in Haraleberry were thought to now have the flu in the spring and were possibly had developed immunity to the fall resurgence. On October 16th, the first death was reported. On October 16th, the Porcupine Advance the first, reports the first death in the town from influenza. Mrs. O. Martel, aged 30, from St. Jerome, Quebec, died at the Windsor Hotel. She had come to Timmins for the winter because her husband was employed with the Metogamy Pulp and Lumber Company, but she was so ill on arrival that medical attention was sought to immediately. Her influenza had developed into pneumonia. When she died, she left behind seven young children. Despite the death, the region was still relatively free from influenza. There had been some other residents from the Porcupine Camp that had died, but in larger cities. In Iroquois Falls, the Yopitibi Pulp and Paper Company offered free inoculations to its employees and provided literature for the care of any cases rising. It should be noted that, the, that an influenza vaccine was not actually developed until the 1940s. The Board of Health in Timmins also printed notices avoiding inf uh, influenza, and at the same time, there were still a few cases of diphtheria breaking out in the Manita area of the community. By October 23rd, there were many cases and 15 deaths. In the October 23rd issue of the Porcupine Advance, the report was that there were over 200 cases of influenza now in the Porcupine Camp and 15 deaths in South End. The majority being Finnish workers, the new school, Golden Avenue Public School, had been turned into an emergency hospital. Timmins Town Council met to discuss accommodation and financial arrangements for the large number of influenza patients as both hospitals were already at their limits. There had also been the largest funeral ever in the Porcupine Camp for George Dewar, a prominent citizen who died in a hunting accident the previous week. His only surviving relative in Canada, a sister, was too ill to travel north. Although the number wasn't given, based on the number of vehicles and carriage rivers reported, plus pedestrians, there were likely over one to 200 attendees at the funeral, if not more. And there were still a few cases of diphtheria in Monita that resulted in deaths. The leap in influenza cases in one week is especially notable in the two advertisements for the Curtis Drug Company that appear on the last page of the Porcupine Advance. On October 16th, the advertisement features a sale for miscellaneous sundry items such as books, stationaries, cosmetics, soaps, and some over-the-counter medicines, as well as patent medicines. And these are the advertisements that you see on the left side of your screen. A week later, on the right side of the screen, the advertisement advises on the use of antiseptic agents and the store's featured products are throat remedies. On October 30th, the Porcupine Advance reported that the death list in the camp was not as large as originally thought to be, 37 deaths in 10 days. The ethnicities of the dead and their names where available were published. The newspaper notes the age range of the deceased are largely 25 to 35 and where we were otherwise in good health. Many citizens that volunteered as nurses, drivers, and other assistants were also now reported to be ill. Not listed among the ill were Miss Burke and her cousin, Laura Elizabeth Keon, the latter who came for a visit from out of town in August and stayed to offer her assistance as a nurse. There's also a death by despair reported. Mr. Fonghorn, a well-known chef in the camp, committed suicide after taking ill. The newspaper reports a combination of delirium and superstition were contributing factors. An inquest with a jury was considered unnecessary. He is said to have had a wife and family back in China. 
The Porcupine Advance reports that he was laid to rest at the new Protestant burial ground in Timmins, but there is no record of his burial. He is likely the Fong Hoyne that appears in the 1911 census prior to the Porcupine Fire and was alluded to in the first presentation on Dead Men's Point. And as you can also see by the headlines that there is some racial bias in the way the death was described in the newspapers. Headlines from the November 6th issue. On November 6th, the Porcupine Advance reports that the influenza pandemic is slackening in the camp. There have only been 24 deaths since October 27th. The first volunteer nurse, Ms. Laura E. Keon of Sheenborough, Ontario, died in her apartment on November 4th. Ms. Burke, her cousin, would go on to recover from influenza, which would be reported in the following week's paper. Laura Keon's mother would come and take her remains back to Sheenborough, Quebec. On November 13th, two days after the ceasefire that ended the Great War, the Porcupine Advance reports that the epidemic is abating in the Porcupine camp. There are still 15 deaths in the past week. On November 20th, the Porcupine Advance reports a total of 87 deaths in the camp, including 16 in the past week. And on November 27th, the Porcupine Advance notes, epidemic appears to be abating here now. There were still four deaths in the past week. On December 4th, 1918, a memorial is proposed. The Timmins Council makes an appropriation to expend not a sum exceeding $300 sufficient to erect a memorial to the late Miss Keon in connection with the public subscription made for the same purpose. Although the meeting minutes from the December 1918 Council rec record this motion, there has never been evidence as so much as a plaque in Laura Keon's memory. Local columnist Diane Armstrong has been a vocal advocate for recognizing Laura's work and having written several over-the-hill columns about the matter in the local newspapers. In late April of 2021, almost 103 years after Laura's death, the Timmins City Council passed a unanimous decision to honor her contribution with a plaque. It is not yet known when and where the plaque will be installed. Headlines from December 11, 1918. On December 11, for the first time in almost two months, there are no front page headlines in the depths of the camp. It is noted that the emergency hospital that was set up in Menina has cost over $2,000, but will hopefully be closed as soon as possible. On page two, the Porcupine Advance reports that there were no deaths in the camp from the previous week. On December 18th, the Porcupine Advance reports that the churches will reopen on Sunday, the 22nd of December, and the theaters the following day. Within that article, it is also noted that there have been no deaths from the influenza in Timmins since December 2nd. There are still people sick with influenza, but the cases seem to be milder. An advertisement for the reopening of the movie theater shows that they were going to be playing film Hall Kane's The Christian, which is a movie from 1914, um, that would be starting as soon as the theater is reopened. On December 5th, 25th, Christmas Day, influenza ends in the headlines. Uh, the Porcupine Advance reports that influenza, the influenza epidemic is over in the camp. The official count is 100 deaths in the papers. Timmins, 46. South Porcupine, 28. Schumacher, 13. Moneta, 6, Mountjoy, 3, and other areas in the districts, such as surrounding lumber camps, was 4. I did an unofficial count, death count based on the headlines, and my number comes up to 116, but there may have been some duplication in the reading of the notes. On page 7 of the very same issue, there is a headline, Indians Dying from Flu in Connaught. This is the first and only reference in the 1918 given to influenza and the surrounding Indigenous communities. Five Indigenous residents died in the previous week, none of whom were tallied with the totals of the Porcupine Camp, and many more were reported ill, in the words of the paper, seeming to fall easy victims to disease. And Mr. Herbert Tripp of Timmins and Mr. Steinhauer of South Porcupine went to Connaught to assist, and it is not known what happened after. Although the peak of the influenza pandemic in Timmins seemed to be from the months of October through to December of 1918, there were still cases popping up in 1919 and many people live with the long-term effects often dying at a younger age years after the influenza. 
The Porcupine Advance, like all newspapers, is good for capturing the spirit of history as it happens. However, sometimes it takes looking at the content of the collected nows in a different shape to gain a better understanding of context. In the 1990s, a group of volunteers with the Timmins Museum National Exhibition Center created an index to the 38 years of the Porcupine Advance, issue by issue, covering names, subject matter, and notable, notable events. This index, a project over a decade in the making, comprises of over 50,000 known records and cross-references, all handwritten on 3 by 5 inch index cards. It also creates the index to the digitized version of the newspaper, which can be accessed online around the world at any time. To tr transcribe each index card online has taken over, over another decade with multiple reference department staff copying and verifying each card on its own website page. Early on, while I was transcribing the index online, back in the drawer labeled A, I came across this entry for Angrion JN. The pencil in note on the top of the card referencing JN Angrion's death from influenza on October 30th was added by me after I had started entering each article reference online. It was not unusual to find a death notice or an obituary appear several times in the Porcupine in advance, especially since at that time the newspaper only was published once a week. And certainly having a funeral service three months later because of influenza would not have been out of place at the time. What struck me was remarkable was the number of in-memoriam entries that were on the card. The card here was marked card one by the original indexer. This is the second card. This is the third card. Note that the most recent date, the, third, the middle of the three listed, is now 30 years after J.N. Angrion's death. Curious, I was wondering if such an expression of grief and remembrance reflected a young soldier's widow. I searched in the microfilm of the newspaper, discovered that J.V. Angrion, as he was listed there, was one of the seven deaths in Schumacher under the headline Influenza Epidemic Slackening in Camp. For nearly a decade after transcribing the records, I didn't give much more thought to the three decades of in-memoriams until this presentation. The last index in-memoriam is from 1948, but now with the Percupine Advance searchable online, I wondered if there was another in-memoriam for the following year. The newspaper ceased publication in July of 1950. Sure enough, there was an anniversary high mass at St. Alphonsus Church that was going to be held in Schumacher on October of 1949. I then wondered, did J.N. Angrion's wife continue honoring his memory even a, every year until her own death? I discovered her cemetery index that her name was Valida and both she and John were buried in the Timmins Memorial Cemetery. She died in 1967. Through the cemetery department, I learned of her date of death being April 26, 1967. I found her obituary was published the following day in the Timmins Daily Press. It mentions her surviving immediate family and that she was a pioneer of the porcupine who arrived in 1909. Her husband, John, is never referenced in the obituary. As expected, Valida's last in memoriam to John was published in the Daily Press on October 28, 1966, 48 years after her husband died. There is no in memoriam in October of 1967, nor is there one for Valida in April of 1968. Nevertheless, John and Valida are buried in a family plot in the Timmins Memorial Cemetery in historic Catholic Section B. The photograph that you're seeing here comes from findagrave.com and was taken by Matthew Poulin on March 30th of 2021. Less than 10 years after the influenza pandemic in the Porcupine Camp, the community experienced another tragedy. Hollinger Mine Fire had occurred on February 10, 1928. There was a death toll of 39 miners in the accident, all of whom died from asphyxiation. This newspaper headline comes from uh, February 16th of 1928, and there is an excerpt that says, The Mayor of Timmins, Ontario, 
His Excellency, the Governor General of Canada, has asked me to convey his deepest sympathy to the relatives of all those who lost their lives in the Hollinger Mine disaster. In the following week, on February 23, 1928, in the second section on page 7 of Porcupine and Vance, there was a small birth announcement of three lines. Born on Thursday, February 16th, to Mr. and Mrs. Jack Costello of South Porcupine, a son. Congratulations. The section I'm calling A Life Between Three Lines. It makes references to Lef Costello, Canada's Flying Father, which was written by Charlie Angus in 2005. Leslie John Thomas Costello. Leslie Costello was the second child and first son born to Jack and Claire Nee O'Grady Costello of South Porcupine. Jack worked in the Doe Mine, a career that would span for 43 years. Clara was a homemaker who was also involved in the Catholic Women's League of St. Joachim's Parish Ladies Auxiliary in the Porcupine General Hospital. Leslie was born on February 16, 1928, just six days following the Hollinger Mine fire. Mining Hockey in the Great Depression The Porcupine Mines attracted thousands of unemployed men from across Canada in the 1930s. They often set up shanty camps at the edge of town and would wait by the gates of the mine every morning in hopes of finding work. Included with these men were many accomplished hockey players. In addition to finding work, they hoped to gain a spot on a company hockey team. John Paris, J.P. Bickle, a businessman who had invested in the McIntyre mine in its early days back in 11, is one name synonymous with the two worlds of mining and hockey. In 1924, J.P. Bickle invested in the Toronto St. Pat's to help them with their finances. In 1927, he hired Con Smythe manager of, to manage the club and renamed it the Toronto Maple Leafs. In 1931, he coordinated funding for a new arena, which was constructed in just a few months. Maple Leaf Gardens opened on November 12th. Six years later, at a time when young Leslie Costello would have been 10 years old, J.P. Bickle set out to construct a smaller version of the Maple Leaf Gardens near the McIntyre Mine. The McIntyre Arena and Community Centre opened on December 8, 1938. It featured a hockey rink, a curling rink, a mirrored skating rink for figure skaters, a bowling alley, auditorium, coffee shop, and gymnasium. It was known as the finest hockey and community centre in the North. This slide highlights some of the influences that Leslie Costello would have seen in his childhood. We're unable to find a picture of him playing hockey as a youth, but this is a photograph of a similar uh, hockey team that would have been made up of boys around his age. This is from the Central Public School junior hockey team photograph, and actually it features future NHL Hall of Fame player Alan Stanley, who is the right-hand boy in the back row. This was published in the Porcupine Advance on March 7th of 1938 as Costello himself played with the Golden Avenue Public School. Like countless other children of that era, Leslie enjoyed playing hockey outdoors on makeshift rinks all winter, and he also enjoyed playing baseball in the summertime. He was also quite adept academically, and he loved to read. He also enjoyed poetry and carried around a pocketbook for his compositions. In 1939, when he was 11, he wrote a poem about his sports hero, Lou Gehrig, who retired in July of that year, ill with amyotropic lateral sclerosis, ALS, formerly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Two months later, World War II broke out and there was another influence on his poetry. When he was a teenager, Les Costello's skills as a player earned him an invitation to join the local Holman Pluggers, a competitive junior hockey team. He signed on in the fall of 1943 at the age of 15 and in the spring of 1944, the Holman Pluggers won the championship for the second year in a row against the dominating team from St. Catharines, Ontario. Costello's playing attracted the attention of priests from St. Michael's College School, nicknamed St. Mike's in Toronto. St. Mike's was not only an educational opportunity, but a lead-in towards playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. St. Mike's Majors was one of the two junior hockey teams, the other being the Toronto Marbles or Marlies, that were for prospective future Leafs players. Lex Costello's acceptance at the school left an impression on many of his peers, several of whom would follow a similar path to professional hockey, including his brother Murray. He started grade 11 at St. Mike's in the fall of 1944. In 1947, the St. Mike's Majors won the championship against Moose Jaw, 
The team would not win another championship until 1961. Later in 1947, Costello signed on to play with the Toronto Maple Leafs and played in the 1948 Stanley Cup championships, which they won. In the summer of 1950, at the age of 22 and with two years of NHL experience, Les Costello decided to leave professional hockey to further his education and become a priest. To many, Leslie Costello's decision seemed drastic and sudden, but he had considered priesthood since his high school days at St. Mike's. He first had to complete a three-year degree in philosophy, followed by four years of theological training. On May 31, 1957, at the age of 29, Les Costello was ordained at his home parish in South Porcupine. For the first few years of his career, he served in Kirkland Lake and Noranda, Quebec, and also played on the local hockey teams. In his work as a priest, Les Costello witnessed the hardships of many individuals in a time when the only forms of assistance were the church or the community. He had an unconventional hands-on approach to helping those in need, as well as a persona of being brash and foul-mouthed. Nevertheless, he was always able to recruit volunteers to assist him in helping those in need. The picture that you see on the left is a portrait of St. Martin de Poires, who lived from 1579 to 1639. He was a Peruvian lay brother in the Dominican church, and he was mixed race. He also helped many people that were in need and was made a patron saint of the poor. In 1963, a friend, Father Brian Buck McKee, approached Father Costello with an idea for a fundraising event. There had been a child in North Bay that had lost the use of one eye, and Father McKee came up with the idea of a one-off charity hockey game against the local radio station's personalities to help fund the child's medical treatments in Toronto. Combining hockey, religious humor, and slapstick comedy, the charity game raised over $3,500 and led to several requests for other appearances. The Flying Fathers established themselves as a team, and by 1971, they had a schedule of over 30 games per year, touring across Canada, parts of the United States, and even at Canadian Forces bases overseas. During those years, Father Costello served in Cobalt, and then was assigned to the Nativity Parish in Timmins in 1973. In 1979, he took charge at St. Alphonsus Church in Schumacher. A Near-Death Encounter in late October of 1979, just after he started at St. Alphonsus Parish, Father Costello went out partridge hunting. He had left his hunting camp alone without any matches, food, or compass, expecting that he would be back by around noon. After shooting a partridge, he realized he was lost. He wandered around trying to make his way back as the weather grew colder. Poorly dressed for the conditions and feeling the effects of the cold, he lost his balance trying to cross a beaver dam and fell in the water. As he tried to get out, he also lost a boot in the water. He used his hunting bag as a shoe and the partridge body to keep his foot warm. He even resorted to eating some of the bird raw for food and for sustenance, and he prayed to St. Martin de Porres, his favorite saint, and in his words his prayer was, If you want me to continue your work for helping the poor, get me the hell out of here. Right after this prayer, he heard two shots fired, which came from an Ontario Provincial Police search party. He fired two shots in the air in reply, and the police found his location. Although he was located, Father Costello and the police would have to walk 13 kilometers out of the woods. The rescuers lit a fire to warm him and his foot up. Unfortunately, warming up frostbite rapidly and then re-exposing the injury to the cold is very damaging. Father Costello's toe prob problem alluded to in the local newspaper would end up being the surgical amputation of all but three of his toes. Back on the ice. With the loss of several toes, Father Costello's ability to skate was impeded considerably. Nevertheless, he got himself back on the ice, often skating alone in the McIntyre Arena in the early morning. He continued his work with the Flying Fathers and continued his charity work at St. Alphonsus Church. Famously, in 1982, he was gifted a truck to help with his charity work, which often involved moving large appliances and furniture pieces. He promptly sold the truck to buy more furniture and food for people in need. Les Costello would turn 75 years old on February 16, 2003, and would be required to retire at that age. With the uncertainty of what would come after retirement, he still carried on with his charity work, including playing some hockey games with the Flying Fathers. On Saturday, November 30, 2002, he was playing a game in Concordon when he lost his footing, fell backwards, and struck his head on the ice. 
you had to leave the game. In the days that followed, he stayed in his hotel room under the watch of friends until he was convinced that he should go to the hospital. While getting ready to go, he kept dropping items and struggled with dexterity. An ambulance was called and he was rushed to St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. Soon he slipped into a coma. On December 10th, 2002, Father Les Costello died, two months short of the age of 75. Morning, a local legend. These are all the headlines that came from the Daily Press the day following his death, December 11th, 2002. It was estimated that there would be several thousand people attending his funeral, and in order that nobody would be left out, the funeral was moved to the McIntyre Arena. On, Dece on Monday, December 16, 2002, the funeral took place for Father Costello. There were over 2,200 funeral attendees, making it one of the largest funerals in Timmins history. A Life Between Three Lines Leslie John Thomas Costello, 1928-2002 to His life could be summarized as an athletic youth and talented hockey player, a Stanley Cup team player for the Toronto Maple Leafs, priest and charity hockey player of national acclaim for over 45 years, a hands-on caregiver to those in need, and some of the legacy names. The Father Costello Community Care Centre, which encompasses the Lord's Kitchen, St. Martin de Porres, Timmins Food Bank, and the St. Vincent de Paul Charities in Timmins. Father Costello Drive, formerly First Avenue in Schumacher, and the Father Les Costello Memorial Arena in Cobalt, which unfortunately was closed in 2016. Father Costello is buried next to his parents in Section D, Catholic of the Tisdale Cemetery, which is located near the Western Entrance Way. His headstone bears a simple inscription. Father Les Costello, 1928, 2002. Three words. Lived, laughed, loved. Thank you. This is a select bibliography of some of the sources used.